This week, we're going to dig into our second lie in this series. And I'll tell you right up front, to this week's lie is a tough one. And the reason why it's a tough one is because it's kind of true. Sort of. But it's a lie. But not really. You know, the hardest lies, the most dangerous lies, are the ones that are true. The ones that are based on truth, and they have a lot of truth in them, but they may be used to try to manipulate you or mislead you, or truth, what I call truth with an agenda. Remember when my kids were young, I'd ask the question, did you brush your teeth? Yes. And then I later discovered I had to ask the qualifier, today. Or when you go, I hope there's no, not, not, no offense to the car salesman in the room here, if there's anything like that, but you go to get the, the used car salesman, and you go and you ask about the car, and he says, that's a beaut. It started up beautifully on that cold, it was a cold morning, and it started up right away. That's the truth. But what the, the truth that he's not telling you is that even though it started up beautifully, it died after about two minutes on the highway. So it's a truth, but it's a misleading truth. It's a truth, but a truth with an agenda. And that's what today's lie is. And that is this. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. You over there, you're not good enough. You down there, you're definitely not. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. We're going to see how this lie slash truth, which all of us struggle with today, in the world that we live in, especially right here, we're in the D.C. metropolitan area, whether you're Arlington or Leesburg, like I said, you live in the D.C. metropolitan area. You live in a highly competitive area in so many different aspects. We are performance-oriented. We are social media comparison junkies. And it is very easy for us. Every one of us struggle with this lie of you're not good enough. And that can manifest itself in different ways. Maybe you're a career person, so you're not good enough at work. Because you didn't get promoted this year. And everyone else got promoted this year. These people all got promoted, but you didn't get promoted. And especially us in our world today, that we talk a lot about our work and our career. So everyone got promoted, you didn't get promoted, you're not good enough. Or maybe you say, you are the friend. You're not good enough as a friend. Because you can't afford another one of those trips. Another one of those trips to celebrate somebody's bachelor whatever, or birthday whatever, or half birthday, or quarter life whatever. And I can't afford it, so I must not be a good enough friend. Moms, I must not be a good enough mom because I'm not like the moms who their kids are signed up for 500 activities and they play the piano and they speak French and they speak German and they do Taekwondo and they meal prep and I'm just some sucker who just prepares, prepares my meals on a daily basis like, like a Neanderthal. So I'm just, I'm not good enough as a mom. I'm not good enough as a friend. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I call that the performance trap. And this is something that we're all subject to, and that's this. That to be better, I need to do more. But because I can't do more, I'm not good enough. You heard this before? You thought this before? You said this to yourself? We all have. To be better, I need to do more. I need to do like she did. I need to be better like that person. I need to fulfill that New Year's resolution that buried under a pile of other resolutions. I need to do better. But because I can't do better that I'm not good enough. And I find myself falling prey to this trap. And in case you're wondering, priests, do we know how this works? Priests fall into this more than anybody else. You know why? Because we have no job evaluation. You have somebody to tell you if you do a good job or a bad job. I don't have that. I do whatever I want. And I, I, the, the only real measure of a priest's evaluation is whether people like him. So it really leads to people pleasing and it really leads to, to you may feel good on one Sunday. Like you knocked it out of the park this Sunday with a great sermon. But guess what happens after you knocked it out of the park on Sunday? Sunday comes again seven days later. So imagine that, that, that great presentation that you gave and you worked so hard and you did whatever it is. Imagine you have that on a weekly basis and all that. So as a priest, I know exactly what this is. And I always wonder, am I doing a good enough job? Am I leading people closer to God? Or am I messing? Because if I mess up, like you mess up, and, and, you know, whatever happens in your workplace. But I mess up, and it's like kingdom of God mess ups, like lightning and thunder from above kind of mess up, like earth open up and swallow. That's what my employer does. Okay, it's written in the, like in the history books. That's what he does if you don't do a good job. So, yeah, I know exactly what this is like, that I never feel good enough. And I know I, I, don't, I don't portray that. I appear very confident. But I always feel like I'm not good enough as a preacher. I'm not good enough as a leader. When people ask me for advice, I don't know what I'm saying. 
I just, I do my best that I can. I don't know if I pray enough. I don't know if I read the Bible enough. I don't know if I. So you're not alone. You're not alone if you feel like you're not good enough. And you know who else tends to think you're not good enough? What makes it really bad? The Bible tends to agree. The guys in the Bible, if I read it properly the way you read it, if we read it the right way, they kind of look at there and they tell me you stink as well. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Read this with me all together. All the failures, all the not good enoughs in the room all together. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So even St. Paul is like, you're no good. You're not good enough. You have fallen short. Now that expression, fallen short, I think back to a time when I was in probably like 6th grade, 7th grade, something like that. We used to play basketball all the time outside. Okay, we have come home from school, throw the backpack down, we run outside and start playing ball. And we used to play basketball and just play for fun and whatever it is. And then there was an invention that happened somewhere in the middle, the mid 80s, maybe like late 80s, something like that. And it was called an adjustable rim. Okay, if you had an adjustable rim. So the 10 foot rim now all of a sudden became seven feet rim. So we would have dunk contests. All right, and we would get out there, and I'm embarrassed to say this, we would lower that thing down to seven feet. Seven feet, is, I mean, we would lower it down, and this is the embarrassing part, and then we'd pull out the trampoline. You know, that's what we had to do, okay? That's how we were, okay? The Middle Eastern genes didn't, didn't do me well when I was young, okay? So we didn't have the 40-inch vertical. That, so we would lower that sucker down seven feet, and we would pull out the trampoline, and in our minds, it was dunk time, and we were doing all kinds of different stuff. And there was one particular day in particular, I remember, we had just watched Michael Jordan come fly with me. Anyone remember Michael Jordan come fly with me? Like those videos of Michael Jordan? Probably too young. But anyway, they used to make these videos. We watched Michael Jordan come fly with me. So I said, you know what? I'm going to try that when we get outside. And the particular dunk that he was most famous for was this one. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to do that. Okay? And in case you don't know what that is, you're not a basketball person, that was when he took off from the foul line Okay, and he cocked it back like this, full extension, and threw it down. So I'm like, that's 10 feet, no trampoline. I'm seven feet with a trampoline, should be a piece of cake. So I, when we were getting out there, I told him, move the trampoline back. Move it back. I'm going distance on this one. Move it back. And I got myself, I got a full head of steam, okay, and I got all that momentum going. I ran, I ran, and I planted on that trampoline, and in my mind, it's like, yeah, and I cocked it back, and I'm about to throw it down in somebody's face and win this dunk contest, but then something happened. I realized I'm not going to make it. <laughs> because the thing about this dunk, it's very hard to do. It looks easy, but it's very hard to do. So as I found myself getting closer, I realized I'm not going to reach. I'm going to fall short. So I extended, and I tried to reach and reach and reach, and I fell short, and I didn't make it in. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is I was so focused on the jumping and the stretching that I failed to pay attention to the landing. And what I discovered is landing is even more important than jumping. <laughs> it's the landing that really makes or breaks the whole deal. So needless to say, I'm overexerted and overstretched like this. I kind of landed awkwardly and stumbled, and I ran right into that pole. I won't tell you which part of me hit the pole, but I'll tell you I was open in this position right here. <laughs> so it was a day that will never be forgotten, a day that lived in infamy as I'm writhing in pain on the floor, and everybody's laughing because that's what guys do with each other when they're in pain. That day, I learned what it means to fall short. And what St. Paul says is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What St. Paul is saying is you are not good enough, it seems. You do fall short. And again, I don't need to go to the basketball example to prove that. Like, I got enough examples in my life, I bet you you do as well, of all the promises of I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to make that mistake again. Or I promise I'm going to start this now. Or I promise I'm going to stay away from that. Like I have a million examples, as do you, of the many, many, many times that you and I have fallen short. So therefore, when the devil says, you are not good enough. 
Is he right? Is he right? Is it true or not true? Sort of. When the devil says, you're not good enough, your response is, sort of. Say it with confidence, sort of. Depends how you define who I am. And I'm going to say it this way. I'm not good enough. My actions, true. My identity, lie. Do you see how that works? You're not good enough. My actions, true. I failed and failed and failed and failed and failed. True. But my identity, false. Lie. Not true. More than enough is my identity. Let's try to understand what this means. We're going to look at a passage from Philippians chapter 3 of when St. Paul was writing to a group of people in the church of Philippi. And in it, he's talking, he begins by speaking about kind of his spiritual resume, his background. Now, for those who don't know, if anybody was good enough, St. Paul was the guy. If anyone's actions was enough to be good enough, it was St. Paul. Because his resume is unparalleled by all standards. A guy who dedicated his life to God and to doing what God asked him to do. But what he's going to say right now is that in the end, all of my actions, all of my accomplishments, all of my spiritual resume in the end was nothing more than a big pile of something. And we'll see what that something is. We're going to pick it up in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. He says, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Meaning like, if anyone thinks their actions are good, none can match mine. Because I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he starts off by saying, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day, meaning like, I come from a good family. I'm a good boy. I came from a good family. Like my dad was a good guy. My mom was a good, my, good lady. My parents, my grandparents, I come from a good lineage. I got the pedigree. In addition, when I stepped into it myself, okay, I was concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. You know what that means, blameless? Blameless doesn't mean perfect, the way we think of it. But think of it in terms of like what it literally means, without blame. Nobody ever blamed me or accused me of breaking one law. Nobody. Like imagine that. And you know, by the way, when, the, when, when he says the law, the Pharisees' law, was like we got like 10 commandments. They took the 10 commandments and they expanded on them to the tune of 613 commands. And not only those 613 commands, not only number one, he knew them, he memorized them, he kept every one of them. So that no one could ever say, ha, I caught you, Paul. Rule number 412, you broke it. Ha, I caught you. Cheese on the bean burrito. I got you. Nobody could ever say that to him. He was blameless. If St. Paul was graduating from the Hebrew class of whatever year, he would have been sumo cum laude, or whatever that word is, okay? Honors of honors of honors. He would have been valedictorian of the class. So if anybody could brag about their actions, anybody was good enough, it was him. But St. Paul says, we'll see in a minute, he's like, ah, I didn't fall for that trap. I know the performance trap. I know that to, do, to be better, you got to do more. I know that trap, he says this in verse 7 and 8. He says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as, I'm about to fill in that word as in a second. But first what he's saying, he's saying all that stuff that I did, all the performance, all the accomplishments, all the achievements, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. He says in the end, that's garbage. That's no good to me. I don't, that, all that stuff to me is a pile of scubula. Say scubula. Say scubula. Scubula is often translated, if you go to the New King James, this will be the word rubbish. Other translations would say garbage or trash. But anybody who understands, who's written a commentary or explanation will tell you that that is a very tame and mild translation. 
read exactly what the Greek word scubula means. It's any refuse, as in the excrement of animals, of things worthless and detestable. King James translated as dung. And dung is a fun word to say in church. And anybody, like I said, who understands the original meaning will tell you this is as close as you can get. Scubula is as close as you can get to a curse word in the Bible. I'll let your imagination take it from there. He said all the accomplishments, all the efforts, all the I did, I did, I did. All those things that I say, look at me, how great I am. All of that, I count them as a pile of scubula, dung, worthless, trash, rubbish. Verse 9. Why? That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having, here's the important part, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ The righteousness which is from God by faith. What St. Paul is saying right here is, am I good enough? Are you good enough? Are we good enough? By actions, never good enough. Even me, all my actions in the end, that's a big pile of poop. Okay, that's all it is in the end. But we are good enough in a different way. We're good enough through faith. We're good enough through believing. Believing in what? Believing in my identity. The truth about who I am. Not what I've done, but who I am. Because God tells me that I'm his son. God tells me that I'm his, you're his daughter. God tells me that he's a great king. The greatest of all the kings. The king of all kings. And I'm his son. And that makes me, regardless of my actions, regardless of what I got on chemistry, regardless of what my boss thinks about me, if my dad is a king, then I am royalty i'm royalty even if the other people in the thing want to kick me out of the royal family tough got to talk to the king king says you're part of my family you're royalty you're good enough because you're mine not because of your actions actions always fall short no matter how hard you try if you're trying to be good enough by your actions you're gonna be going to depression because it's never gonna come a point in time where you stop sinning You're never going to stop having bad thoughts. You're never going to stop having lustful desires. You're never going to be completely selfless. If you're a mom, there's never going to be a point in time where you are the perfect mom and your kids are perfect and your house is perfect and your husband is perfect and everyone just rises up in the morning and says, thank you, dear mother, for wiping my snotty little nose and my scooby-filled diapers. Thank you so much, mom. You're the best. That ain't going to happen. Happens in the movies. That doesn't happen in real life. Never going to be a time where you can't honestly say that there isn't someone out there that feels like you're letting them down. All of us have been there. None of us are perfect. But the good news is, that's okay. That's okay. Because my righteousness is not based on my action, but based on my identity. Let me say it another way. My worth isn't based on what I do, but what he's done for me. Say that with me. Say it all together. Say it with me. My worth isn't based on what I do, but what he's done for me. And then the second part, Leesburg, I want to hear you as well, all together. My value isn't based on who I am, but rather whose I am. My worth isn't based on what I do. That's how we view things. My worth is based on what he's done for me. And my value isn't based on who I am, but whose I am. You know the word for this? There's a word that summarizes all of this. It's a word called grace. You may have heard of it before. Unfortunately, we don't talk about it enough here in the church. Grace means that the only goodness that I have or you have, the only reason that I can say that I am good enough, that I am anything enough, is because of him who is in me, of myself, zero, but with him, perfect. I'll give you another example, make it clear. Another basketball story, but this one ends a little bit better. When I was in college, we used to play pickup in the, in the gym. We had like our little group of friends. And we were like, okay. They were really dragging down the team. Okay, the other one's okay. But, you know, we were just a bunch of average guys and whatever it is. And whenever we go to the gym, you know, especially like when the athletes would play, like we'd play the place close to us where the athletes would play, they, they would kill us. 
okay? And they would always be very good, and we'd pretty much one and done for most of the time, because again, all my teammates were not as good, okay? And then one weekend, we had a friend of ours from high school who actually was really good. He played college ball at his college, and he showed up. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I had a teammate my equal, okay? <laughs> all of a sudden, I had someone comparable to me. And with him on our team, then all of a sudden, we were winning. And all of a sudden, we're pretty good. In fact, we're more than good. We were good enough. Now, here's the key part. Our actions didn't change. Like, we were still the bad news bears, dribble it off the foot, but they hit me in the face and trip. Like, we were still that. We didn't change our actions. But the difference was, with him on the team, all of a sudden, our identity was now different. You see how this works? I'm going to show you a passage from Ephesians chapter 2. St. Paul describes what grace does and how grace works. Okay, we won't dig too much into it, but just I want you to understand how it's exactly this point about my actions. No, but my identity. Yes, it says it this way. It says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And again, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's grace. And grace, the undeserved, free gift of God, is like the most fundamental tenet of Christianity. Everything we have in Christianity is based on God's grace for us, not our earning it, but on God giving it to us even though we didn't deserve it. Now the thing is, grace, believe it or not, we don't like grace. We don't talk about it because we don't like it. You know why? Because we like one plus one equals two. It's more American. Work hard. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Like, that's, that's us. And we like, if I do good, I am good. And if I do bad, I am bad. Because no one ever defines their stuff as bad. So if I do good, I'm good. But that person does bad, so therefore they are bad. We like it that if I read the Bible, if I go to church, throw a couple bucks at the homeless guy on the way to the metro, I'm good. Because I did good. Oh, and hold the cheese. Hold the cheese at Taco Bell. Hold the cheese. Look at me. I'm good. I'm good. Do you know who else likes the system of if you're good, if you do good, you are good? You know who likes that system? The devil. The devil loves that system. That's his favorite system. The devil would love to convince you, I promise you, love to convince you, no, do good. Do good so you can be good. Do good so you can do more good so you can be more good. Do good, do good, do good, do good. I want you to do good, and I want you to know that you're good because you did good. You know why the devil wants that? Because you know what is inevitably coming? The day when you don't do good. You prayed today, so you're a good boy. You prayed, you're good. You prayed, you're good. But he knows there's going to be a day when you're not going to pray the day you're going to sleep in. He's just waiting for that day. Or the day where you're not going to be as self-controlled on the beltway when somebody cuts you off. Or the day that you are going to lose your temper with your kids or with your wife or with your husband or with whoever it may be. He is just waiting for you on that. He's setting you up. He's saying, yeah, be good. I'm encouraging you. Be good. Be good. Look, you're a good boy. Look, you're good. Because the devil, just think about this logically. If I can convince you that if you do good, you are good, then if you do bad, you are, I got you. Now your mind says the devil. Now I got you. You fell into the trap. I got you right now. You're going to fall short at some point in time. And if you have, if you have combined your identity or based your identity on your actions, I got you. Because I know where your actions are going to lead you. I'm good. Not because of what I do. 
but because of what he has done. I'm good, not because of who I am. I'm good because of whose I am. So then the natural response to that, so doesn't matter then what we do? It doesn't matter what we do? And anyone who's uncomfortable with grace, so it doesn't matter what we do? And that's the fear. If we tell people about grace too much, then they won't have a motivation to be good. Well, that's the equivalent of saying, don't tell your kids that you love them because they might not study as hard. Make sure that they know you'll only love them if they study really hard. No, it's the exact opposite. When my kids know that I love them, no matter what, they're motivated to study more, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> and same thing with the grace of God. The grace of God encourages us because I know that I'm good enough. It encourages me to work more. So I want to say it, different, say it this way. We don't work for approval. We work from approval. You see the difference? We don't work for the approval. We work from the approval. We work because we are approved. Not in order to gain it, but because we've already been given it. Best example. Famous movie, Little Orphan Annie. Everyone knows the movie uh, Little, Little Orphan Annie. Girl on the street, no good nothing, nothing to live for, no value, no nothing. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes later into the movie, she's all of a sudden living in this big house, big daddy Warbucks, big everything that you need, everything she could possibly have, all of a sudden, she's good. From here to here, what was the difference? Her actions? Could she ever, could you ever work your way to this point, little orphan Annie? Okay, you know what I'm going to do? Because Big Daddy Warbucks did this, and because, because of whatever it is, then I need to repay him. I'm going to clean my room and do the dishes and mow the lawn. That ain't going to repay it. I'm going to change his oil and rotate his tires, and I'm going to cut his hair. Well, that one's easy. You didn't have any hair, but you know where I'm going. No, that's not going to do it. Does that mean you don't want little orphan Annie to do anything? No, little orphan Annie. I want you to do all those things. But I don't want you to do it for my approval. I want you to do it as a thank you because I've already given you my approval. You're already in my family. You already got everything. There's nothing that you're lacking. I'm not waiting for you to do those things to get this. I've already given it to you. And I think God says the same to us today. We don't work for acceptance. We work from it. All of the work, all of the work, all of the work, scubula, big pile of scubula. Big pile of nothing. But grace, grace, man, that's the real deal. You remember in the beginning, I said, you're not good enough. True, lie, sort of, halfway. And then I showed you a verse in the Bible, Romans 3.23, that kind of said you're not good enough. That said all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, let's look at the verse after that. Because the verse after that, remember I told you, like, did you brush your teeth today? Okay, the, the verse 24 is the today part of it, which paints the whole picture and gives it to us the right way. Romans 3. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But here's the second part. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Ah, uh, now we have the full picture. So the devil didn't want us to see verse 24. He liked verse 23. He didn't like verse 24. Verse, 24 says, verse 23 says, not good enough. And verse 24 says, but that's okay. You don't need to be good enough because I got you covered. Because we are justified freely by what? By his grace. Said another way, we're on his team already. But I'm not good enough to be on the team. I'm not good enough to play basketball with that guy. You're already on the team. We're going to win with or without you. Whether you get in the game, like we're going to win. I'm not good enough to be in his family, but you're already there. Here you are. You're in it. You're part of his family. And you know what? Once that last name, once that we talk about baptism as like a brand, okay, like a brand, like a seal, like, like when they used to, the, for the cows, brand right there. Property of God. Don't touch. Leave me alone. Property of God, sealed forever. But I'm not good enough, and I messed up this. Look at the brand. But I didn't whatever. Look at it. I'm part of God's family. That's my name. Can't be kicked out. 
My worth is not based on what I do, but what he's done. My value is not based on who I am, but on whose I am. My actions, never good enough, but my identity is untouchable in Christ. So, to the mom who's doing the meal planning, got your kids in the piano and the flute and the clarinet, and your kid reads languages, and your kid is just the best kid in the world, God loves you and accepts you as you are. But to the mom who's doing none of that, God loves you and accepts you as you are just as much. No difference. You're killing it at work. You are climbing that ladder. Everyone says, you're the best, you're the best. God loves you and accepts you. Your identity in him, great. But you're the guy who doesn't know where he's going to get his next meal. You're paycheck to paycheck, if paycheck to paycheck. You're struggling. God loves you and accepts you exactly the same as the other guy. No difference. You're the superstar Christian guy. Okay, you got all the commandments memorized and you know the verses and you have the little apps and you know the secret handshakes and you're like Mr. Mr. Church guy, okay? You got beans coming out of your nose and ears and everywhere, like you're that guy. God loves you. You're, you're on his team. You're on my team forever. And then the other guy who's struggling, mess up after mess up, all wondering every day, am I ever gonna be good? God loves you and accepts you exactly the same as the other guy because it's not based on the works. It's not based on being good enough in action. It's our identity. And in case you struggle with this concept, in case you, like, there's two groups of us, like those who tend to think, like, spatially, And those who tend to think like creatively, you love this and grace and it's great and it's emotional, it's whatever. I'm more of a logical person. So I struggle with doing better doesn't make me better. I struggle with that person, I'll be honest. I struggle. But then I came up with a logical, mathematical, rational way to justify and understand the grace of God. It's very simple. It's science. Tell me what is infinity plus one? And tell me what is infinity minus one. So let's say infinity plus two, plus three, plus four, plus ten, plus a million. What's infinity plus a million? Infinity. What's infinity minus a million? So God is infinity. God is bigger than infinity. God is infinity. So therefore, you're really good. And you're really great. You're plus five. You're plus ten. And you're plus a hundred. You're plus whatever. Your net in the end is infinity. And those on this side of the room, y'all are struggling, okay? Y'all are minus five, y'all are minus 10, y'all are minus 100. Well, what's infinity minus 100? Same as those people. It's infinity. It's math. It's science. It's logic. Nothing you can do can make you more accepted in God because you're already his son or his daughter. Nothing you can do can move you up from the infinity level that you're at by the same token if you're not good enough your actions fall short we all fall short it doesn't make you any less loved and accepted by him when you understand that when you understand that you have power devil can't mess with you easily if you don't get that Man, the devil can. Pee, 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 pee. You're 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 Pinocchio, okay? The puppet in his hand, okay? Like he move you wherever he wants. But when you understand that, you're not gonna fall prey to that. You stand strong against the devil. He says you're not good enough. You say I know I'm not good enough, and I never will be good enough. But that's okay, because I don't need to be good enough. See, I don't need to be good enough, because in God. My faith in him, I know who I am. You know the only person that expects you to be good enough? Only one person does. Yourself. And when we fall short, like let's be honest, I see people come to me in confession and guilt and feel bad. And I say to them, you know, God is not surprised by this. 
And as your father of confession, with all my due respect, I ain't surprised either. The only one who surprises ourselves, because in my mind, I'm better than that. I'm better than that. I'm better than that. But let me show you a verse that I know it may sound discouraging, but when you understand it, it's the most encouraging verse in the Bible, and it's the verse that I'm going to challenge you to memorize this week. Hopefully every week we can memorize one verse. We're doing that in life groups. I'm going to challenge you to memorize this verse. Psalm 103, verse 14. It says, he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He knows our frame. He is not surprised. He knows, and he still loves us. He knows, and he still accepts us. He knew, he knows, he knows what is to come. And says, you're on my team. But God, did you know? Yeah, I knew. And did you see? Yeah, I was there. And do you, what do you think? I, I got you. Let's not run through the possibilities. You're on my team. You're on my team forever. So when the devil says to you, you're not good enough, God doesn't accept you. You flip it. You say, you hear God saying to you, I accept you. So therefore, it's okay if you're not good enough. He says, you're not good enough. You're not accepted. God says, you're accepted. It's okay if you're not good enough. I got it covered. And I don't know about you, but as someone who falls into that performance trap a lot, that's the best news ever. That's the most freeing news ever, that I don't need to be good enough, that I am loved infinity right now, that I am accepted infinity right now. And nothing, nothing, nothing I do can make God's love and acceptance of me any bigger or smaller than it already is because it's already infinity. I don't know about you, but man, that makes me feel good. That makes me feel good. He knows my frame. He remembers that we are dust. We may never be enough, but that's okay because God is enough and he's big enough to cover us no matter what it is that we bring to the table. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you for your love for us, your grace for us. Lord, we, there's not even words to say that can, that, can, that can cover the bigness of your love and your grace. We thank you for that, Lord, and we pray that you would help us to understand it more and more every day, especially as we approach the season of Lent and Holy Week and Good Friday and Easter. Help us to experience your love and help us to grow deeper in our knowledge of it. And let us, Lord, when we do the work, do it not so that you would approve us and accept us, but knowing that you already have approved us and already accepted us, and let that to be our motivation for everything that we do in life. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the prayers and intercessions of all your saints. Here says, we pray thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 